Welcome to Pops with Profs, the video series where we get to know our Huron professors. My name is Matson Kitamisi, your Huron Student Council President, and today I'm here with Dr. Steve Bland, the Associate Professor in Philosophy Department. So, Dr. Bland, thank you so very much for joining us today. My pleasure, Matson. So first things off, we would like to ask you uh, the most important question. What is your favorite type of pubs? Uh, as all my students know, uh, I really enjoy club soda. I have one at every lecture. Everyone seems to notice. So it seems like that's the thing that I should be drinking club today. Club soda. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's as amazing. ordinary as you can get. <laughs> that's really amazing. So it just happens so fast that we, we get some uh, ice cold um, club soda uh, here with, with us today. Wonderful. Vanessa. Thank you so much. Dr. Blen, that's how we do things here at Chiron. The only best uh, for our professors. Cheers. Cheers. To get things started, we are going to ask you, you know, fire off some speed uh, round questions. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Here we go. Favorite type of food? Uh, pizza. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Name one item you can't live without. Uh, books. Woo! <laughs> That's fancy. <laughs> Favorite TV show? Sopranos. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Okay, vanilla. Which subject were you worst at in school? Uh, chemistry was pretty bad. That's, mm. I think if we're talking high school, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. was, um, that was a challenge to pay attention to, and therefore I didn't do so well. Mm -hmm. Favorite day of the week? Friday. Friday, weekend. Amazing. Describe yourself in just one word. Curious. All right, now let's get into uh, some of the serious questions. Let's do it. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and what led you here uh, at Huron? Um, I'm from Oshawa, Ontario, so just the other side of Toronto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I went to university, my undergraduate work at Trent University. So another small kind of liberal arts university, a mm -hmm. um, bit bigger than Huron, but I liked that small feel. I had these great philosophy professors who had this kind of superhero-like ability to argue different sides of the issues that I found really interesting and important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would argue one side against what most of the class thought, and then once they had convinced the class of that position, they would flip and then argue the other side. Mm. Really, really convincingly. And so they made my beliefs, my convictions, so much more tenuous, really unstable. And I thought, That's, that seems like a really powerful skill to have. That seems yes. interesting. Yeah. And so uh, I, I, I think, changed my major somewhere in my third year into philosophy and, uh, and then went and did graduate work um, at the small institution across the road, Western University, did my master's and PhD there, and uh, locked out into teaching at Huron because they need, as I was finishing up my PhD, they needed someone to teach the history of scientific thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was doing a, a PhD in the philosophy of physics, so I guess I was just the first person to answer the call, got my foot in the door there, and, wow. uh, and they haven't been able to get rid of me since. Well, we are lucky to have you here at Chiron. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about outside the work. So what do you like to do outside of your work? I'm not a tremendously interesting person. Uh, <laughs> my kids keep me really busy a lot of the time. Um, I like hiking. Uh, I exercise as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy music. I read a fair amount, which I guess isn't surprising. I like Russian literature in particular. Um, 
And I think that about covers it on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. That's what fills a lot of my time. That's, that's really amazing literature, which is actually reading books and uh, other stuff as well, which is, you know, uh, where knowledge comes from. Um, so that's really great. So how long have you been here at Huron um, and what program do you teach? So I've been here, I think, I think I've been here 13 years. As I said, I started out... I'm um, going to drink for that. <laughs> <laughs> I started out, um, as I said, teaching this history of science course, did that for a couple of years, and then taught the kind of the constellation of courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I teach in the, in the philosophy department. I'm now chair of that department. Um, and what have you learned while teaching, you know, philosophy? The, the most important thing I think I've learned, I mean, you're always learning, right? So Absolutely. the answer 10 years from now is going to be different from my answer today. But the thing that, that is, has really been constant for me is that the single biggest pedagogical asset that a philosophy professor has, and, and maybe professors generally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is your enthusiasm for what you're teaching. That's, I mean, just the number one important thing, that if your students see that you're enthusiastic mm -hmm. about what you're talking about, that's, it's contagious, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I've learned is I've got to tailor the syllabus, the outline, that the arc of the course to what I find interesting, not mm -hmm. what I think all students need to know because you know the skills that you really want your students to pick up yeah. they're going to pick up much more readily if you're talking about something that they find interesting and then they can exercise the skills of taking arguments apart of putting them back together of challenging mm -hmm. presuppositions of reading really carefully if you give them that motivation that reason mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they're more much more likely to learn the things the skills that you're hoping to impart and it's not so important that they read you know, Descartes or Leibniz in particular, <laughs> they, should, they should read what you find most interesting because that's the way that you're going to impart whatever wisdom you have mm -hmm. to them. Enthusiasm is so important. Uh, and so yep. the more energy you can show and share and distribute, mm -hmm. the better off you're going to be as an educator. And actually, that's, that's what you know, everyone wants because uh, when you get to like what you do, you can actually attract other people to, to, to be impressed by what you do. Actually, that's a great lesson and I'm taking it from today going on. Um, so what do you like uh, about being professors? Um, oh. Again, another big question. There's so I, I, many I things know, I like. I know we, we touched a little bit yeah. Uh, before, yeah. I mean, uh, what I like about being a professor and a philosophy professor in particular mm -hmm. is I love the activity of playing with ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's far less solitary than you think because, of course, when you're playing with ideas, you're usually interested in the ideas that other people have written about. So you're constantly reading from across different places and across different times. You can read Plato from 2,300 years ago. You can mm -hmm. read Descartes from 400 years ago. You can read something that uh, a, a Greek philosopher wrote 2,300 years ago. I can read and think about today. And mm -hmm. then I can mm -hmm. relate it to, to my students and we can talk about it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. play with that idea and what makes sense and what doesn't and how can we apply it in our lives and is it important, right? Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy that. And they're very, they're, I mean, there are very few jobs where you can devote your entire professional career to doing just that, right? <laughs> and that's something you like the most. Um, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, going back to the previous question, that's what if you can if you can show students what's so magical about it, mm -hmm. right? And for most students, it's it's you know they have a four-year window or a five-year window, or if they're doing more graduate work, you know, an eight-year window. But it's usually it's a it's a portion of their life where they mm -hmm. get to do this, yeah. right? Yeah. Where they get to come to a place like Huron, play around with these ideas, take on board some of them, mm -hmm. have some of them shape their lives and their identity and their views about the world, and mm -hmm. then go out into the world, right? And, and then yep. see how those ideas interact mm -hmm. with their lives and the lives mm -hmm. of other people. It's, it's a very important opportunity. It's easy to, to take it for granted and uh, I mean, I'm sure I, I do, but I'm also deeply appreciative, uh, uh, fairly regularly, <laughs> of being able to do this, you know, not just for four years, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. for my entire professional life. This is what I get to do, and I'd be mm -hmm. doing this anyways. You know, if I, if I had some job on Wall Street, I wouldn't, but if I did, <laughs> right, I'd go home and I'd read philosophy. 
and I get to do this every day. Mm -hmm. And actually, Huron uh, being small and being amazing, it's actually the best place to do that. Um, so, Dr. Bland, uh, students would like to know, uh, what is your favorite, one of your favorite memories while teaching here at Huron? It's hard. There are so many, there are so many great memories. I mean, it, it, the, the really great stuff, well, it happens inside and outside the classroom. But I guess the memory that's, <laughs> that sticks in my mind um, in terms of what, what's happened inside the classroom happened maybe eight years ago or so. And uh, I was teaching this fourth year course on Kant's, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. It's a big toaster-sized book. Very important, very, very difficult. Originally written in German a few hundred years ago. Been translated, really difficult to get through, about 800 pages. And um, I was preparing for one of the lectures mm -hmm. on the most difficult part of the critique. And I'm spending this week on this, just this 10 pages. I thought it would go quickly. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to understand it. And at the end of the week, I realize I just, I don't have it. I don't know. You know, I don't know what this means. And I have a few different interpretations, but none of them really make sense. And I thought, well, I'm just going to have to go into the class. Mm -hmm. And I've failed because I'm, you know, I'm going to get in front of them, in front of my students, and have to just admit, I don't know what's going on here. So I go into the, the class and I tell them right from the very beginning, I have to level with you. I don't know what Kant is talking about here. I don't know what the argument is. Uh, I mean, I know the conclusion, but I don't know how he gets there. And then students started asking, well, but, but could it be this way? I would say, ah, no, mm -hmm. I don't think so, and here's the reason. And another student would say, well, can it be that way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe, but, you know, and so what I ultimately ended up doing is saying, wow, okay, you, you, you guys are interested in this, even though it's quite obvious that I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. what was clear was they were more interested Right? That if your prof comes to you and says, I don't know what this means, can you help figure, me, figure this out for me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, it's a wonderful opportunity, right? It's a motivation. We spent three weeks on that 10 pages. I had to cut out the last 200 pages of the book because we didn't get to it because we spent wow. three weeks on this 10 on pages. That. And then it, it became clear to me that the best learning opportunities don't happen in that model. They happen mm -hmm. when you sit you down with your students. engage with students. Honestly. You, you ask the ideas. Yeah. That's right. And mm -hmm. you, you manifest your vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. You say mm -hmm. what is, you know, Especially a very yeah. difficult phrase, I don't know. That class was special to me. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a, that's a really fond mm -hmm. memory of kind of learning learning on a small scale, which is what Huron is known for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of that happening in this unexpected, unplanned, but completely joyful kind of way. What, what I can say, we, we cannot say like, you know, one of your favorite memories, but we are just going to say it's one of the amazing memories because, you know, we get to, you know, to see uh, a lot of what happened here at Huron and uh, because of the small uh, class sizes and uh, amazing students that we have here at Huron, it's actually, you know, uh, an amazing experience that uh, actually happened even to students uh, in philosophy department. That's, that's really great. So um, what piece of advice, the, the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? Well, as a, as a philosopher, of course, I am tempted to look to philosophers for advice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, the, the one of the beautiful things about philosophy is that you can commune with the ideas of philosophers all over the world in different times and places. And um, I guess this piece of advice is about 2,000 years old. Maybe it goes back further than that, but it, it comes from um, the Stoic school of philosophy. And mm. it's, a, it's a technique that you use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the technique is you take the mundane things in your life that are sometimes difficult to do, that when you're faced with things like this, these, these daily tasks, mm -hmm. One way to reframe it, to think about it differently, is to tell yourself to, to fully appreciate something you already know, which is, at some point, there will be a last meal that you make for yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. That at some point, 
uh, perhaps you won't be able to make a meal for yourself, right? Someone else is going to have to make your meals. And you can use it for anything at all, right? That, that yeah. those day-to-day -day things that we can often find challenging, especially on challenging days. So not really, really terrible things, but the things that you do often, but that can be difficult routinely. And to, tell, to just come to grips with the fact that to realize, someday I'll never get to do this again. And it allows you to be grateful for the opportunity to do it when you're doing it. So instead, mm -hmm. it reframes the task from a, from a you know, you're, you change the story that you're telling. From, this is one more thing I have to do today, to, aren't I lucky I get to do this again? Because this won't always be the case. Mm -hmm. That is a, it's a piece of advice that I find kind of enduringly mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and, you know, Dr. Blend, we can, you know, continue talking and talking, and actually we are going to learn a lot from you, but, you know, for the sake of our time today, um, if my last question for you today is, if this video um, goes viral and millions of people get to see it, uh, what do you say, what do you want to say to them? What I would want people to learn, to take away, to try and appreciate is that um, failure is not always, and in fact, even not usually, a bad thing. And oftentimes, it's a really, really good thing. Mm -hmm. Because... And that's the thing we don't have to talk about, like we don't talk about it in a society. No, we <laughs> talk about success. Yes. Right? We avoid <laughs> yes. talking about failure. Yeah. And yet, success must come from failure, because the way to succeed is to improve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. of us want to be better at the things that we care about than we are right now. Well, of course, you're not going to improve just by willing yourself or just by thinking harder about it, right? The way to improve at anything from uh, athletics to essay writing to painting is to practice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah. that's what the activity of practice is. And so we tend to think about failure in this in, in this in the moment kind of way. We, we tend to think of a failure only with respect to a particular attempt. Mm -hmm, we think, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have failed here. I have failed to get the grade I wanted, or I, you know, I failed to to um, to get to get through this to understand this book, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. or this section of a book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the the thing to understand is that this is just one episode in a longer journey and that failure is prerequisite to improvement and to success mm -hmm. so uh, you know trying to to do to do more to embrace failure and see it for what it is a necessary mm -hmm. ingredient in improvement and success that's what i would that's what i want my students to take away from so many of my courses and the yeah. millions and millions of people to, to watching this to. video. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Blend. Again, uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, well, Fox, uh, that's all we have for today. Um, thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll catch you next time on Pops with Pops. Cheers.